So 2.2 part two is a little bit more on the calculator, finding complete graphs, a little bit with intersections and getting the right window. Right. So just to kind of give us a problem to, to work with, we're going to start uh, by looking at a problem where we have a company that has two types of costs. Okay. They have fixed costs and they have variable costs. Okay. So this particular company has a fixed cost of $200,000. Okay, maybe that's the, um, the salary they have to pay all the employees. But then they have a variable cost of $1.50 for every shirt they make. Okay? So the more, the more shirts they print, they have to use you know, maybe ink and, and shirt material. So that's a variable cost where the salaries of the employees are not variable. Okay? They, they stay the same regardless of how many shirts are made in a day. Okay, each shirt sells for $4. Okay, so what we're going to do is come up with um, two different equations. We're going to come up with an equation for the total cost of the company and then the total revenue. Now, just to kind of clarify that, cost is what the company has to spend to make the product. Revenue is how much money they take in. Revenue is not, according to our book, their profit. Okay? Revenue is just how much money did they take in. Okay? And then after, you have to deal with the costs somehow, and you can figure out their profit. All right, so to set up... Um, some algebraic uh, equations, we're probably going to need a, a variable somewhere. Does anybody think um, they can tell me what the variable would be in this problem? What is it that we, we don't know? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we don't know how many shirts that they're going to sell. Um, so what do you want to pick for that variable? Pick any letter you want. S? S? Sometimes my S's look like fives, so I'm going to stay away from S. But S's would be a good one if, if your S's don't look like fives, but sometimes they look kind of similar. Um, how about we pick a different letter? Oh, I, I would just go with X. X, sure. But if your S's, if you won't confuse them with fives, go for it. Um, so I'll use X for the number of shirts. And let's come up with a, let's do the cost first. Okay, the cost as a function of how many shirts we sell. C of X. Okay, anyone think they can give me a, or give me an equation for the cost? Yeah, go ahead, Zach. 0.5x plus 200,000. 200, yep. Good. Okay, so at 200,000, that's a fixed cost. That 1.5, that's the cost per shirt. Right now, let's come up with a formula for our revenue. Okay, and revenue is just how much money they take in. It's not uh, necessarily profit. Okay, so what, what's our revenue here? Oh, Tom? All right, so the revenue, that's what are they taking in when they, when they sell their product? How much does their product sell for? $4 per shirt. So our revenue here would be 4x. Yeah, good. Okay, so there's, there's our two equations. And now they want a graph of that. Okay, before I um, even type it in, any values for x that do not make sense? Yeah, we're not going to look at negatives, okay? Because negative numbers of shirts, um, that can't happen. All right, so we've got 1.5x plus 200,000. What kind of equation is that? What's it going to look like when I graph it? Yeah, it's going to be a line. What's the slope of that? 
1.5, and what's the y-intercept? 200,000. All right, so that tells me that um, what, I, what I probably want to do here is set my y, y max at least to 200,000. It's probably going to have to go even higher. Okay, X is the number of shirts we sell. Okay, it's probably going to take quite a number of shirts because what we're going to do is look at how many shirts do they have to sell so they start making money. All right, so I'm just going to start it at 10,000 as a maximum, and we'll see if we'll see what happens. Uh, y max, um, I, I would start at 300,000, but that's probably going to have to go higher. Okay, so that line in blue, that's our, that's our cost. The line in red is our revenue. I don't know if you can tell easily, but they are catching up. Okay, the line in red has a steeper slope. So eventually, they will catch up. Um, so let's, um, let's increase that by a factor of 10. See what we see now. All right, so now we can kind of see them catching up uh, a little bit more. Um, I don't think we need to make X max any higher, but uh, Y max, let's try it at um, 400,000. Okay, and I think that should be good enough. We're going to see where these lines cross. I hope. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so as far as finding a complete window, bless you. There is put it on the screen. Okay. Here is your complete window. That was zero. Okay. Any questions on, on that graph? All right, so we can see where these two graphs cross. And when you're talking about a model of cost and revenue, where they cross has a special name. That's called the break-even point. So the break-even point, it's the point at which the cost and the revenue are the same. So if you actually visualize this as a graph, we already kind of said it, but graphically, where is the break-even point if you graph the line for cost and the line for revenue? Yeah, it's where those two lines cross. So it's where the lines cross. Um, graph, it's not the only way we have to look at this. You can definitely do a cost revenue problem algebraically. Um, and we'll, we'll try it that way too. Okay, but graphically is one way you can do it. Bless you. Okay, so the second example says find the number of shirts that the company has to sell in order to break even. Okay, can somebody remind me again, what's the break even point? It's where what equals what? Yeah, it's where cost equals revenue. So now, basically, if we're going to do it algebraically, just go back to the previous page. Here's your formula for cost. Okay, we're going to fill that in here. And here's your formula R of x. That's your revenue. Fill that in there. And then just solve your equation. Okay, so I'm going to get 1.5x plus 200,000 equals 4x. Yeah, and algebraically, pretty straightforward. We should be able to solve that in two steps. Um, Quinn, what's my first step to solve that? Um, divide both sides by 4. Or no, um, subtract 1.5x from the left side. Yeah, I would do that first. We want to subtract 1.5x from both sides. And Andrew, what does that leave me with? So 
So 200,000 equals how much? 2.5. Yep, 2.5x. Okay, and Ayla, my last step would be? Yeah, now we want to do our division. Okay, so 200,000 divided by 2.5. They have to sell 80,000 shirts, okay, in order to break even. Okay, so that's the algebraic approach. Um, graphically, we're, we're pretty much already set up for it. All we have to do is calculate something. Okay, what do I press to calculate where these lines cross? Yeah, David? Second calc. Second calc. Um, and then you want to find the intersection. And then intersect. Okay, so pick a point on the first curve, the second curve. You can put the guess all the way down here. It doesn't really matter because unless there were two intersection points, whichever one you were closer to, that's what the guess would give you. But it'll find it. And that's how we could solve it graphically. So if the company sells 80,000 shirts, what will their cost be to make 80,000 shirts? Yeah, 320,000. What will their revenue be if they sell 80,000 shirts? 320,000. 320,000, yeah. That's the Y value. Okay, so X is shirts, Y is your money, whether it's cost or revenue. Depends which graph you're looking at. Okay, now if they start selling beyond 80,000 shirts, that's when the profit, the line in red, finally goes above the, the costs. So now they start making money. Okay, questions on that one? All right, so that was the last part of um, section 2.2. Okay, so we'll spend most of the time today on section 2.3, uh, which, again, I think you've already done most of it in Algebra 1, okay, solving linear and quadratic equations. Okay, so first of all, what, what an equation is. An equation is anything that has an equal sign in it. Hey, or a little more formally, it's a statement of equality between two expressions. Does anybody notice what word you don't see in that definition, but a lot of times equations have these in them? In fact, our last equation had one of these in it, but it's not in what I wrote up there so far. How about Josh? Can you think what most equations have in them? That this definition says nothing about? Okay, so yeah, this doesn't say anything about having like addition or subtraction, but we usually have those in an equation, uh, but you don't have to, to have an equation. What else does this not mention anything about, but usually you have them? Variables. Variables, okay, you don't have to have variables to have an equation. Okay, two equals four, that's an equation. Okay. That type of equation is a contradiction, it's not true, but it is an equation. Uh, five equals five, okay, that's also an equation. That's uh, an identity, okay, it's always true. But if you have an equation that uses a letter as a variable, such as x, you could say we have an equation in x. And the way I usually say this part is when we're writing an equation like this, I say here's our cost as a function of x, our revenue as a function of x. It's an equation using the letter x. Okay, so to solve an equation means uh, find the solution. Okay, we're finding the values of x that make the equation true. Now when you're solving a linear equation, okay, generally, well actually, how, how many answers can you get at most when you solve a linear equation? Yeah, you can only get one answer at most. 
Okay? Uh, at a minimum, you could get zero answers. Okay, if I gave you the equation 2x plus 5 equals 2x plus 4, you're not going to be able to solve that. Okay, but in general, um, linear equations usually have one solution. Okay, if you happen to have an equation like this one, 3x plus 2 equals 3x, 3 and then in parentheses x plus 1 minus 1, that type of equation is an identity. Okay. What an identity means is it's an equation that is always true. You can think of any number you want for x and it will always work. Can anybody tell me why this equation here is an identity? What, what about that makes it an identity? Yeah, Zach? When you distribute and simplify it, it to the same exact thing. As what? 3x plus 2. Yeah, what's on the left is 3x plus 2. What's on the right is really 3x plus 2. It's the same thing on the left and on the right. Okay, so basically when that happens, you have an identity. Pick any value you want for x, it always works. Versus something like this, a conditional equation. A conditional equation is an equation that can be true if you pick the right value for x. So like 2x equals 10. That's an equation that could be true if you pick the right number for x. Okay, so identity, always true. Conditional equation could be true. And the last type of equation, which I didn't write down, is a contradiction. That's never true. Okay. That would be, again, something like x plus 1 equals x plus 2. You can't solve that equation. It won't work. Okay, so um, let's see, how about, um, Rachel, is this an equation, 3x equals 12? Yes. Yeah, that's a conditional equation, yeah. How about, um, Alyssa, what if I wrote um, 3 equals 7? Is that an equation? Yeah, that's a Yeah, that's a, that's a contradiction, okay, that's an equation, but it's not true. Um, Francisco, how about... 3 plus 6, is that an equation? I'm sure. Anyone help him out? What do we think? Amanda? Right, that's just an expression. Okay, an expression doesn't have an equal sign in it. So that is not an, ex not an equation. Okay. How about 3x plus 2? Now I threw a variable in there. Is that an equation? No. That's, that's, an ex that's an algebraic expression. The first one was a numeric expression. That's an algebraic expression. Okay, that's not an equation either. And how about 2x plus 4 equals um, 2 times x plus 1 plus 2? What kind of equation is that? That's an identity. You do out what's on the right, you get 2x plus 2 plus 2, which is a plus 4. Same thing on the left and on the right. That's an identity. All right, so if they want us to verify that a number is a solution and they give us a number, all you've got to do is plug it in and see if you get a true statement. Okay, so here, all they want us to do is verify that negative 2 is a solution to that equation. So what am I hoping happens? When I plug negative 2 in on the left, I'm hoping that it simplifies and I get an answer of what? About Francisco? Yeah, we're hoping we get an answer of zero. And Pacey, what does that mean if you plug negative two in and you get an answer of zero? That means something special about negative two. What's that mean if you plug in a number and the answer comes out to zero? David? That indicates a solution of that problem. It's a special solution. 
Yes. What kind of solution is it? <coughs> it's a root. It's a zero. It's an x-intercept of that equation. Okay. So if you plug in a number and get zero, it's an x-intercept. Or root, or however you want to say it. All right, so let's plug it in. Um, when I plug it in, what should I do? I especially want to do this when I type it in on the calculator. But I'm going to write it down as well. What do you think you should do anytime you plug a number in? Just to be careful about how you plug it in, especially on the calculator. Yeah, you always have to put parentheses, especially when you have negatives involved. Because if you do this on the calculator versus something like this, you're going to get different answers. Okay, so anytime you plug in, um, always use parentheses. All right, so we got negative 2 cubed minus negative 2 plus 6 equals 0. Okay, this I think we can just, just do it out. Um, Trevor, what's negative 2 cubed? Negative 8. And Molly, what's minus minus 2? Becomes a plus 2 plus 6. Okay. Again, that's a question mark. We don't know if it's a solution. We're, we're hoping. Negative 8 plus 2 is negative 6. And at this point, we can see that negative 6 plus 6 is 0. So we verify negative 2 is a solution. Which means negative 2 is a what? Root. It's a root. Good. How many possible roots could a cubic equation have at most? Yeah. It could have three at most, and knowing one of them would help us to figure out the other two. Okay? But that's uh, not what we're going to get into today. Um, well, if you plug zero in for x, that gives you a y-intercept. Tells you where it crosses the y-axis. Um, but to find where else it crosses the x-axis, it's a little more tricky. Um, we have to use um, long division with, with polynomials. Maybe you learned synthetic division at one point. Um, you could do that here. But, um, well, that's later chapters. All right, so that's uh, an example of a linear equation okay, using the variable x. Okay, a and b can be any real numbers that you want. Except a can't be 0, because if you plug 0 in for a, look what you just do. You, you wipe out the linear term. And now all you have is a constant. OK, so really quick, we'll, we'll go through this equation, solve it. Um, but this is like week one algebra one stuff, so we should be able to solve that really quick. Okay, Grayson, can you tell me um, first thing I have to do, or maybe a couple times I have to do it on the left-hand side? Yep. Can you tell me what I get when I do all of that? 4x plus 3. Good. 5x plus 2. Okay, and Alyssa, what would my, um, what would my next step be? Um, you can combine like terms. Yep, I'm going to combine like terms. And what will that give me? on the left. 7x minus, Seven X minus 3. And on the right, you still have the same thing, 5x plus 2. OK, Pacey, my next step. OK, I'm going to add 3. All right, so let's do both at the same time. We'll move the 5x over to the left, and what's that going to give me? And if you move the negative 3 over to the right, that'll give you 5. And my last step, divide by 2. So x is 2 and a half, or 5 halves. Okay, any questions on, on that? All right, so I'm assuming everybody could solve, uh, you know, Basic, well, it's not a, that's not a basic one because it's got distributive, but algebra one, any algebra one kind of equation. All right, so another type of algebra one equation is an absolute value. Okay, some people forget a little about it, so we'll, we'll just go through it. Okay, the way you solve uh, 
absolute value, okay, which is going to look something like this, is we're going to take and split it into two problems. Okay, the first problem you split it, split it into is exactly the same as the original. The only thing you do is you take away the absolute value bars. Okay, so the first equation you split it into, same as the original, except without the absolute value bars. Okay, the second equation you split it into is the same as the original, except you take away the absolute value bars and you have to do one other thing. Okay, we have to negate the number on the other side of the equation. Okay, that means change the sign of. So second equation, same as the original, except you've got to do two things. Take out the bars and change the sign of the number that's on the other side. Now, all of these steps assume that you've already done this. You've already isolated the absolute value expression. Okay, and the problem I'm going to give you, that is also already going to be done. If that wasn't done, you need to do that first. Isolate the absolute value expression. Okay, example three, that's a problem where the absolute value expression is already isolated. Here's an example of a problem where it's not. Um, these two equations are exactly the same thing. One of them already has the absolute value by itself. The other one doesn't. So in order to get what's in the absolute value bars by itself, what's the first thing you would have to do on the equation I just wrote down? Yeah, you'd have to divide both sides by 2. Okay? And then you would have the equation I have right here. Okay? What if I had something like that? That's another example where the absolute value is not isolated. What's the first thing you'd have to do here? Yeah, you'd have to subtract 5 from both sides. Okay, so you've got to get this block of stuff by itself first. Okay, and the problem we're going to do, it's already done. Okay, so you don't have to worry about getting it by itself. All right, so now split it into two problems. Can somebody remind me what the first equation, how I get the first equation when I split it up? What's my first equation? Yeah, Quinn? It's the same thing without the uh, absolute value bars. Yeah, it's the same thing. Except just without the absolute value bars. Okay. Questions on that one? Okay, and how about my second equation? Well, mom? Okay, so we're going to get rid of the absolute value bars. And what else? And um, negate the number on the other side. Okay, so what does that mean when we negate the number? Mm -hmm. What does negate mean? Negate the or you might have to make it positive. It depends on if it, it already is negative. Okay, so you change the sign of the number. Okay? Um, so if I do that, um, how about Allie, what, what will I get for my second equation? 2x plus 3 equals negative 5. Yeah. We don't care what 2x plus 3 comes out to. As long as it comes out to either a 5 or a negative 5, when we take the absolute value of it, we'll get what we want. Okay, so we solve it. 
2 x equals 2, you get x equals 1 on the left. On the right, when we subtract the 3, we get 2 x equals um, negative 8, or x equals negative 4. Okay, and since these are both answers, the way the book writes it is and. So x equals 1 and x equals negative 4. Okay, questions on, on that? Okay, what if you had an absolute value problem like this? Anybody tell me the two equations you would split that into? Yeah, Alec? 3x plus 1 plus negative 4. Okay. 3x plus 1 equals 4. 3x plus 1 equals 4. Now when I solve each equation, I get 3x equals negative 5. Or x equals negative 5 thirds. And then I get 3x equals 3, or x equals 1. Check the answer x equals 1. Just plug it back in. Does it work? No, that doesn't work. And I'll tell you right now, if you plug in negative 5 thirds, that won't work either. So what went wrong? Something's wrong. Because if you did this on the test for this problem, I would mark all this wrong. That's not right. Yeah? Well, it's an absolute value, so it's going to come out positive. So an absolute value equal a negative isn't good. Right. You can't have an absolute value equal to a negative number. You can try. You can follow all the steps. Um, but you're never going to plug something in for x and then take the absolute value and ever get a negative. Okay? So this kind of problem is... No solution. Okay. How about if I um, had this? No solution, right? Because it's an absolute value equal to a negative. You want to agree no solution? Molly? Well, you have to still add T. If you add two, it's still a negative, so no solution. You divide by negative two, so it's negative Remember, that's multiplication. So to get that negative two on the other side, you need to divide. And what that's going to do is turn this equation into that. Now that's definitely solvable. Okay? So there's all these little things you have to. Uh, watch out for when you solve absolute value equations. Okay? Make sure the absolute value expression is by itself. and Make sure it's actually something you can solve. If it's equal to a positive or zero, you can solve it. If it's equal to a negative, uh, you cannot. Okay, but this is the typical kind of problem. It's equal to a positive, two solutions. Okay. Questions on absolute value equations? All right. Uh, another kind of problem we look at in this section is a mixture problem. Okay. Sometimes you do mixture problems when you look at systems of equations because you can set it up as two equations with two variables, which is, which is how we can do it. Some people, when they, rather than setting up two equations, like to do substitution in their head. So on paper, they only have to write one equation with one variable. But we won't do anything in our head in this problem. Okay, so when we're mixing two different quantities, okay, generally they're going to give us um, an information about how much stuff they want us to mix. Okay, they'll say something like, when you're all done, we want to have uh, 40 gallons of stuff. Okay, and the other thing they're going to tell us is usually a concentration. So you're going to be mixing two different liquids together. Maybe one of them has a 10% concentration and one of them has a 12.5% concentration. 
I want you to mix the 10% and the 12.5%. So when I'm done, I get 11%. And I want to have 40 gallons of it. Okay, that's a very typical mixture problem. How strong of a concentration do you want? And how much do you want? And these are the two equations you need to set up. Um, you'll never be mixing more than two things. Um, we could, but we're just going to stick with mixing two things at a time. So as I said, a trick is to do substitution in your head, and then you can really get away with, with one equation if you basically solve equation one for one of the amounts and plug it in in the second equation. So what, what I'm saying is if you solve for amount two, it's the total amount minus amount one. So if you plug in total amount minus amount one right there, you would have all amount one in the second equation. And you wouldn't have two variables. Okay, but if you don't want to do that part in your head, we'll just do it on paper as a, as a written step. Okay. Does everyone have the two equations? Okay. All right, so we have two solutions we're going to mix. One of them is a 10% solution. The other one is a 25% solution. And I want to mix them so that when I'm done, I have 15 liters of stuff. And I want the concentration to be 12%. How much of each solution do we need to mix? Okay, so I don't know how much I'm going to mix of either solution. And since I don't know how much I'm going to mix, what does that mean I should probably do right now? For both the 10% solution and the 25%. Oh, Josh? We want to set up equations, but we can't even set up equations till we do this first. How much of the 10% solution do I need? Not sure? Exactly, you shouldn't be sure at this point. That's the answer to my question. You're not sure. So if you're not sure, what do you do? We're gonna to try to solve for it, but I don't know what it is right now, but I need a way to represent it. So, yeah? Yeah, I have no idea how much of each solution I need, but I somehow have to work with these solutions. So just pick two variables to represent each amount. Okay? So that's going to be the amount for each solution, okay? x and y. All right, so what's one equation that I could set up based on the information that they give me here? Yeah? X plus y equals 15. Right, x plus y equals 15. Right. Now the other equation has to do with concentration times amount plus concentration times amount equals the final concentration times the total. Okay, so Ava, what's um, the concentration of our first solution? 10%. And whenever we work with percents, whether it's an interest rate problem or anything like that, how do we usually write a percent? Yep, as a decimal, and we have to do the same thing here. Right, what's 10% um, as a decimal? 0 0.10. So concentration times, and Quinn, how much of the 10% solution am I going to use? X. Exactly. X plus my next concentration, 0.25, times how much of that I'm going to use. Um, Trevor, how much of the 0.25 solution? Y equals, Molly, what's my 
final concentration going to be? Yeah, we're trying to get a 12% solution. And Amanda, what's my final amount? Fif exactly, 15 liters. Okay, so see how that second equation follows a nice pattern? Concentration times amount, concentration times amount, concentration times amount. Okay, now we can um, simplify that second equation a little bit. Okay, so that's not the equation I'm going to use. Um, does anybody see what you can simplify? Get a number four. But Kayla? Something there you can do out. Uh, yeah, so well, with the total amount, that's the 15. Okay, what do you want to do with the 15? Multiply by 0.12. Yeah, let's multiply it by 0.12 and just get a, get a nice number for that. And in fact, if you don't want to keep writing 0 0.10, you can just write 0.1. Same thing. And I really don't need to keep parentheses unless, unless you want to. What's um, 0.12 times 15, Molly? 1.8. That's my second equation. Now I have two equations with two variables. What, what should I do here to solve this, Ellie? You can solve one equation like the top one for the variable. All right, let's solve the top equation for one variable. Which variable do you want to get by itself? Y. Y? Somebody else tell me, using that top equation, what is Y equal to? Yep, 15 minus X. All right. And now what am I going to do with that 15 minus X? Yep. Plug in 15 minus X for Y at the second Yeah, plug that in right there. That's the part you could have done in your head if you don't want to do it on paper. And you get an equation with all one variable. 0.1x plus 0.25. You definitely want to keep parentheses here because it's a distributive property. Equals 1.8. Now this is just like the equation I had you guys solve that had distributive property in it. Um, a few examples back. So we have 0.1x plus, yeah, um, somebody do that for me. What's 0.25 times 15? 3.75 minus 0.25x. Okay, let's combine like terms. What's 0.1x? Take away 0.25x. Negative what? Point yeah, negative 0.15x plus 3.75 equals 1.8. Um, now we need to bring that 3.75 to the other side, and what do I get when I subtract that? Now, it's good that we got a negative on both sides, because if I didn't, I'd be running into a negative for the final answer, and we certainly shouldn't get a negative amount of liquid. Okay, so my last step, I'm going to divide, and what do you get when you divide 1.95 by 0.15? So have I um, answered everything that they wanted? No, I've only found how much of solution x. I still need solution y. How much of that one do I need? Two. We know that we wanted a total of 15 liters. And I already mixed 13. So I need two more to get a total of 15. Okay, so that's a, a very typical mixture problem. All done algebraically. We could have also used graphing calculators to, to help us, but um, we didn't. Any questions on 
any part of that mixture problem. So the last, yeah, last type of problems we're going to look at are quadratics. Okay, so quadratic equations are of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. a, b, and c can be any real number that you want, except a can't be zero, because we've already talked about that. If you make a zero, you wipe out the first term. Now you don't have a quadratic. Um, about uh, Rachel, what is one way that you can solve a quadratic equation? You can like plug in the variables into the So like if you had something like what yeah, would you Yeah, you just like simplify it and you combine the terms to see what the Bless you. Okay. How so how would you simplify that? What would you do? So 3x squared plus 4x equals 12. OK. And then I just, I don't know, I do it now. I just like substitute Just guess and try to see? Yeah. All right. So this one, I don't know what the answer is. It might be some awful decimal. So what would you do if it isn't a number? Like I could try 0. That's a quick one to check. Now that doesn't work. So I, I don't know. It might come out messy. Okay, quadratic formula, that's one way. Um, what's another way? You could factor it. That's always nice if it works. And what's a third way? Yeah? Okay, yeah, you can graph it. What's a fourth way? It's an algebraic way, other than factoring or um, quadratic equation. Quadratic formula. We did this way when we talked about parabolas. If you had a parabola and you wanted to know the transformations of this, what did we have to do to rewrite this in a certain way? Complete the square. Yep. And we're going to see all three of those today. Okay, so one way is to factor. Okay, so in general, when you want to factor, step one, you've got to get the equation equal to zero. Actually, whether you're factoring or quadratic formula, first step on both is get it equal to zero. Okay, Pacey, what's my next step if, um, if I'm going to try to factor this? What do I, what do I write down next? Um, yeah, we're going to draw our two sets of parentheses. And what's going to be the first term in each? You really don't have any choice here. It's a different term in each, but what is it going to be? Not sure? Can we help them out, Amanda? 2x and x. Yeah, it's going to be 2x and x. Okay, so I'm really not going through teaching factoring. I'm more just going through an example with you. Okay? Um, if you need help with factoring, make sure you, you know, either come see me for extra help or um, you know, there's tons of stuff online or probably in our book or even I can let you borrow an Algebra 1 book. Okay? But you've got to start out with what times what gives you the first term, okay, 2x squared. And then what about my signs here? So positives, both negative or one of each. Yep? One of each? Yep. So 2x would be, would be followed by minus, and that should be plus. Yeah, and if that's not right, you can always switch the signs later and, and try it a different way. And now I need two numbers that multiply to give me 3. And again, I really don't have any choice here. Okay, when this gets kind of bad, it's like if this last number was like a 24, then you could try 2 and 12, 6 and 4, 8 and 3. There's tons of combinations. But it's only one way you can get 3. Mm -hmm. one and, three. and you want to do them in that order? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's check it. You get 2x squared plus 6, take away 1, gives me a plus 5. And negative 1 times 3 is my negative 3. Okay, so that's the hard part. We factored it. And now, what do I do with each of these factors? Tom? Yeah, if I'm multiplying something times something and getting 0, then either the first thing is 0, or the second thing is 0. Okay, 
So what do I get for an answer for the first half? Yep. You would get a half. Yep, I get a half. And the other answer I get is negative 3. Hey, any questions on, on that one? So x is 1 half and negative 3. Okay, so when you can factor, that's usually the fastest way. Okay, there's not that many steps involved, and you get the answers pretty quick. Um, when we can't factor, that's when we can use a different formula called the quadratic formula. But the quadratic formula is really based on another method. What's the other algebraic method we had besides factoring and quadratic formula? Completing the square. That's all that the quadratic formula really is. It's completing the square. Okay? And we're going to solve this equation for x by completing the square. Okay? The only difference is a, b, and c aren't numbers right now. Okay? They're all letters. Okay, what's my first step? Anytime I want to complete the square. If you get confused, just pretend that A, B, and C are all numbers. What would you do first? Ellie? Yep, you have to put the constant on the other side. All right. Okay, that's why we added what we did to make it complete the square. Does anybody see what that left-hand side is going to factor into? Think about what times what would give you b over 2a squared. Think about the long way to write out b over 2a squared. What does that mean? Right, it would have to be b over 2a times b over 2a. That's the only way I would get b over 2a squared. Right? And then if I do that out, I get x times b over 2a, another x times b over 2a. And that would, if you add those up, it, it does give you what's in the middle. Right? So this is b over 2a. Okay, if you don't you won't believe me, you just foil it out and you'll, you'll get what's above. Okay, it does work. All right, now let's take a look at the other side. Um, at this point, we should probably do out this b over 2a squared. Okay. Um, Amanda, what do you get when you square b? b squared. b squared. And what do you get when you square 2a. 4a squared. Okay. Next thing I'd like to do is add these fractions together. But in order to add them up, what do I need to have? I need a common denominator. So I already see part of the sec second fraction in the first. What would I have to multiply top and bottom by to make these denominators the same? Yeah? 4a. 4a. 4a and 4a. Okay. Now let's rewrite that right hand side a little bit. x plus b over 2a, still squared, equals, now I'm going to write this as negative 4ac. Okay. You could write it as negative c4a, it's the same thing, but I'm hoping that you're starting to see part of the quadratic formula. Okay. We have a b squared and a minus 4ac. All over now, my denominator is 4a squared. Okay. So remember, my goal here is to get x by itself. So the next thing I want to get rid of is this exponent. How can I get rid of this exponent of 2? Amanda? 
Yeah. And square root, both sides. So now I'm left with x plus b over 2a. And when you square root a fraction, do the top and do the bottom separate. Now, can I switch the order of these two things in that numerator? If I have addition, is it OK to switch the order? Yeah, commutative property. You can switch the order you add two things in. So I'm going to write it like this. The square root of b squared minus 4ac all over. And now when I take the square root of the bottom, what's the square root of 4? 2. And what's the square root of a squared? A. So I get all over 2a. And now the last thing I need to do is move this to the other side. And it already has a common denominator. So when I move positive b to the other side, what do I get? Positive b over 2a is going to become, well, it's positive on the left. It becomes negative when I subtract it and move it to the right. So x equals negative b. And technically, when we take that square root, there's always two. There's a positive and a negative. Now, b squared minus 4ac. And because b has a denominator of 2a, and the whole square root has a denominator of 2a, just put the whole thing over 2a. And there's your quadratic formula. Right, so it just comes from completing the square. What makes it a little hard is you're doing it with all letters. So you really have to understand how to complete the square. But if you were doing it with numbers, I think everyone's a lot more familiar with doing it with numbers. Right, so it's really not like a two-hour thing where the formula comes from. It's just complete the square. There's your formula. Right, and you've got to you know, do a little bit of algebra and combine like terms and common denominators, but not, not too bad. All right, so now that we, we have that formula, we can use it. As long as the quadratic equation you're solving is equal to 0. Okay, you always want it equal to 0, and that's how you can identify a, b, and c. Hey, does anybody need me to go through an example of the quadratic formula? I think we've, we've done a few, so um, I'm going to hold off on doing example six. Um, this part under the root, we've mentioned the name of it before. It's the discriminant. And what does the discriminant tell you? It tells you something very important about your quadratic. Anybody remember if it comes out positive, it means something. If it comes out negative, it means something. Or if it comes out to zero, it means something else. Yeah? Is it how many solutions it has? Yeah, it's how many solutions this equation has. How many roots, how many x-intercepts. So if it comes out positive, you get two. If the discriminant comes out negative, you get zero. And if it comes out to zero, uh, you get one. Okay, that was, I think, from last week. All right. um, so this would be a quadratic equation, but what would be the first step in this one? Okay, we'll do the first step, but that's the only step I'm going to do. Yeah? Okay, and there's a couple ways you could do it. How, how would you do it? All right, just bring everything to the left, sure. So negative x squared plus 3x minus 1 equals 0. Now, I, I wouldn't like this if I was going to factor, because when factoring, I like x squared positive. But if I'm just doing the quadratic formula, it doesn't matter. What's a in this case? Negative, I like the negative. Yeah, just negative 1. And what about b? 3 and c? And then you plug it into your formula from that. All right, so our last, um, yeah, this will be our last problem. Okay, so what we're doing is we have, think of like a rectangular piece of paper. 
and we're cutting squares out of each corner. And the reason we're doing that is because we're going to fold the sides up, make a, make a box out of it. So all these sides are going to fold up on the dotted lines. And it says um, the length of the original piece is L. W is the width of the original piece. Okay, so the width is from top all the way to bottom. It's not the width of the dotted section, which would be the width of the box when you fold the sides up. It's the whole thing. Okay, it says the length is twice the width. And they tell us the volume of this box, once we fold it together, is 2,040 cubic inches. Find the dimensions of the original piece of cardboard that you folded. Find L and W. Okay, so they're telling me something about volume. And I'm making a box, okay, a rectangular prism. Um, what's the formula for the volume of a rectangular prism? Oh, Zach, do you remember that? Uh, is it length times width times height? Yeah, length times width times height. Now, we, we know some of these things, okay? I, I know volume. And I think I can figure out length and width, too. Okay, what's the volume of this box when we're all done? That's 2,040. Now, what's the length of this box going to be when I fold up the sides? Okay, just this section. Yeah? Yeah, it's going to be the length minus you cut off 5 for the left corner and then you cut 5 off for the right corner. So the length is L minus 10. What about my width of this section? Yeah. Yeah, the width is W minus 10. And what's going to be the height of this box once I fold the sides up? How high are the sides? Yeah, the sides are going to have a height of 5. Now, the only problem is I have two variables. I have L and I have W. But there's a fact I haven't used yet. The length is twice the width. So what does that mean? Length is equal to what? Yeah? Length equals 2W. So all I'm going to do is take that, fill it in right there. So 2,040. 2w minus 10, that's my length, times my width, times my height. Um, what can I do with, with this 5 to, to get rid of it, put it on the other side? Yeah? Yeah, we can make the numbers a little smaller by dividing everything by 5. We get 408 equals, and I'm going to do this out. Uh, 2w squared minus 20 minus 10 minus 30. And what's negative 10 times negative 10? Plus 100. Okay, and now if I wanted, I could bring the 408 to the other side. And what kind of equation do I have? What kind of equation? Yeah, it's a quadratic. So we can graph it, we can complete the square, we can use quadratic formula, um, however you want to solve it. Um, in fact, really another thing you could do is what could you divide everything by here? Yeah, you really could divide everything by 2. Um, I think that's 154. And it turns out you don't even need quadratic formula. It does factor very nicely. I don't know if I would notice this factors. I would probably just use quadratic formula. But looking in the book, that's how it factors. So I get two answers, 22 and negative 7. 
Which one makes sense? The 22. So that's your width. And then just go back up, plug in, and you can find your length. Okay, so the word problems in this section all boil down to um, basically creating a quadratic. That's a little tricky, I think, that volume problem. So if we need to, tomorrow we can go over um, another one. Okay, that's the um, homework for tonight on page 88 and 96. 88, there's not much because we didn't spend much time on it. Okay, just 35 to 39. Um, and page 96, that's what we spent most, most of the time on today. Okay, that says 1 through 4, 9, 11, 13, 16, 19, and then 24 to 26, 36 to 38, 52 to 54, and 58.